The clip that you just had the opportunity to see from 60 Minutes nicely sets up the topic of our Churchill Club discussion tonight, a quest to bring fairness to the markets. Welcome. I'm Karen Tucker, CEO at the Churchill Club. We are very privileged to have with us tonight Brad Katsuyama, CEO of IEX, and Michael Lewis, the acclaimed author of Flash Boys, A Wall Street Revolt, and The Big Short, among many other very important works. And here to lead them in conversation is Rami Bernitsky from Sapphire Ventures. Their conversation will cover evolving trends, challenges, and opportunities for disruption on Wall Street. But first, of course, as always, some thanks are in order to Rami and the wonderful team at Sapphire Ventures, Shruti, Anis, um, and also Gerald Lamb of IEX. And finally, but um, importantly, RBC Capital Markets. Without the help of these individuals and companies, this program would not have been possible. Thank you. <laughs> A few words about Churchill Club, now in its fourth decade. This is the premier nonprofit technology and business forum serving the innovation community here in the Silicon Valley region. And I have to say, I've been in this role now as CEO, I'm in my ninth year, and it is so gratifying to see so many people here tonight, past speakers, our present speakers, and I think probably some future speakers also. These are the people who care about supporting and sharing in the mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit, and these are people who are willing to contribute their views they see about the opportunities ahead. Tonight's hashtag is Churchill Club, and you'll find other Twitter pointers in your program. Our moderator, Rami Bernitsky, is a managing director at Sapphire Ventures, which, by the way, is an investor in IEX. Rami is also a longtime Churchill Club board member, he was previously a startup CEO, and he held many senior executive positions at SAP. Please welcome Rami Bernitsky. Yeah, so uh, great. I didn't know this is my part, but uh, welcome. Good evening. Uh, so again, my name is Rami Bernitsky, and uh, I'm going to be the uh, moderator uh, and uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have uh, two uh, wonderful speakers with us tonight and I think uh, when it comes to Michael Lewis uh, I can speak for myself I'm a huge Michael Lewis fan and I'm sure there are many many uh, like me in the crowd there you go um, and obviously going back to my MBA days when Liars Poker was was a must read uh, still is a classic uh, but then again the wonderful books that uh, came after whether it's Moneyball um, obviously made into a great movie, The Blind Side, uh, The Big Short, which is now nominated to five Academy Awards, which, which, which is phenomenal. So congrats, Michael, for, for that as well. And uh, last but not least, one piece of anecdote. Michael joins us tonight after pretty much a 20-hour flight from uh, Israel. And so I really appreciate the fact that you're out here with us tonight, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll make it worth your while. Please join me on stage. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And um, I want to introduce you uh, to Brad. And uh, it's interesting. At Sapphire Ventures, uh, we, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and we obviously invest in some great companies as well. Um, and we usually, and I'm, I know that there are some venture capitalists in the room as well, when you normally look at the business, you look at the fundamentals. You know, is it growing quickly? Is it a good team? You know, do you believe in the business? And so on. Uh, and really, every once in a while, a long while, comes along an entrepreneur that really wows you. And uh, every time I had a chance and the pleasure to talk to Brad, I was just so impressed by his courage and his ability to stand up for what's right and also figure out how to uh, make it a great business as well. And as you'll see tonight, uh, Brad is just a wonderful, wonderful speaker and someone who's truly on a mission to change the world and to change uh, our lives for the better. So uh, with, with that, Brad, why don't you join us? <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks. Thank you. OK, so uh, before we uh, talk about Flash Boys, um, Michael, I have a question that I'm sure many folks here uh, would be able to relate to, which is when you, when you think about a book, when you sort of like start embarking on a journey <coughs> to write a new book, do you have a thesis in mind? Is it, do you have an idea as to how the book is going to play itself out, or do you let the story take you where it's going to take you? Much more in the latter than the former. I never, what I never go in, it always surprises me when people ask me when, I'm, like, when I sit down with him in the beginning of, a, of trying to figure out whether it's a book. I spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out whether it's a book. If anybody, when they ask me, what's your angle? Because I never have an angle. And I don't know, I don't know, you know? It, 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 we get, we, gets me going usually is some combination of um, a character who interests me in a situation that I find riveting. And, uh, and, and then I just, you know, I spend a lot of time with him trying to figure out what the story is and, um, and do a lot of work around them. So in, the, in this case, I went up and spent time with his mom in Canada and his <laughs> old high school member and his old high school friends and try to get a sense. I thought he was too good to be true, right? So I was looking for, I, I was actually, it was, the problem with his story was I could not find any dirt. I mean, there was like nothing, and, and uh, it was, uh, and it's hard to bring a character to life when he's yeah. just a good guy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I spent, I spent a lot of time, but I spent a lot of time just kind of trying to figure out what, I don't know what the story is. I'm just interested in the situation and the person. Um, and eventually, yeah, you know, I have to figure out what the story is, but often that doesn't happen, really happen until I've started to write it. And, and things start to happen on the page, yep. and then it starts to take shape, and I'm off. How long did it take you, by the way, to write the Flash, book, uh, Flash Boys? Well, he probably knows better than I do. I think from the time I met him to the time the book a came out, a year and a half, about a year and a year half. And a half. Yeah. All right, Brad, uh, the good guy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that the notion of the book is about really, and, and what IX is doing, is about leveling the playing field. As you were sort of like kind of working your sort of like as during your career and obviously as you were kind of exploring what's going on with the stock market and that's described beautifully in the book, at what point did you have the sort of like the epiphany, the understanding that something's awfully wrong and I got I to gotta figure out what the truth is? Yeah, so, so um, I guess a bit of background. So I, I grew up in Canada and worked for the Royal Bank of Canada, which, which was kind of the, it was the place to work when, when you live in Canada. Um, and moved to the United States in 2002. And I traded energy stocks, I traded tech stocks, and in 2007, just realized that when I'd pull up my trading screens and I'd see an offer for 25,000 Microsoft and I would try to buy it, in 2006 I could buy 25,000, but in 2007 I could only buy 15 of that 25. Yeah. Uh, and by 2009 I could only buy 10,000 of the 25. And um, it, was, it, 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 it drove me crazy. And it wasn't, you know, I. I tell people a lot, I'm, I'm the accidental entrepreneur. I could have retired at RBC. I love the company. Uh, I love the people. Um, they, <coughs> sponsor, they sponsor the event tonight. So That's right. Thanks to my, my former team. Um, I never really wanted to start a company. I, I just never had that desire. Um, but what happened over, over you know, I guess, the course of my career at RBC, we ended up building great products. We went from number 19 to number one in electronic trading. But you realize that we were only helping people trade with RBC. We weren't fixing the systemic problem um, in this very bizarre relationship that developed between stock exchanges like New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ uh, and a group of high-speed traders that people, most people in this room will have no idea who these firms are. Um, why are these the most important customers of the stock exchange? And that, that was kind of the, 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 the mission that we went on um, and then continued in, in, into IEX. So really it was, it was kind of, and I, I think it kind of, was very similar. I saw Michael go through this same mental exercise because at first you're turning some rocks over and you find some stuff. Um, and actually, the, the, I met Michael. He was writing a story about somebody else. Um, there was a guy, Ser Sergei Lanikov, gets thrown in prison for taking right. high frequency yeah. trading computers. He's also featured in the book. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, can I explain how this book came Please. about? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll spell him for a sec. <laughs> it, 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 um, uh, when I was working on the big, this starts with the big short. I was working on the big, I was finishing the big short. How many people have seen the movie of the big short? All right, there we go. Pretty good, right? Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, so in the movie, the guy, Vinny, Danny, and Porter, the three guys who, you know, and they make the jokes about the testicles, and they're all just funny. The guys who got out of Florida and the alligator gets them, and those guys 
um, they are just wonderful sources about Wall Street, generally. And uh, they, they, as I was finishing the big short, they said, we got your next book for you. And I said, I, I can't tell you how many times people tell me that. And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they said, no, there's this guy from the Royal Bank of Canada who's running around who's explained to us what we're seeing on our trading screens, which is bizarre. And it's, an, it's just the story of the century kind of thing, because they were stock market investors. Um, and I said, yeah, 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 and I ignored them. Uh, and then a, a year and a half later, I'm reading about this Russian computer programmer, high frequency trader, comp tra trading programmer for Goldman Sachs, who is thrown in jail uh, for stealing high frequency trading code from Goldman. And, and my state of mind at the, that moment was, you're telling me the only person on the back end of the financial crisis who gets thrown in jail from Goldman Sachs is the person Goldman Sachs wants thrown in jail. I thought, that's a story. <laughs> and then I realized, and so, so I went and I happened to know the guy's lawyer. So I had some access to him. And I realized then that I had to all of a sudden know about high frequency trading, that, which Vinny and Danny Porter were trying to tell me about 18 months earlier. And I called him up. I said, that guy you said I was going to write a book about. I, I, could he explain to me how this works? Because until then, no one even mentioned high frequency trading. Uh, this is the beginning of the mentions in the newspaper. And so we all went out to dinner. Vinny, Danny, Porter, and, uh, and me and Brad, and Ronan, right? Ronan, where are you? Ronan, there he is. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, Irish comic relief, yeah. <laughs> but also well, an impressive character, uh, Ronan. He was, uh, but anyway, so, um, and at the end of the dinner, I thought, my God, they were right. This is a book. You know, I mean, so I started to listen to these, and, and it took a while to figure out how to do the book, but that's how it began. So, so I have a question which I reserved for later, but I'm, I'll probably ask it now. What kind of parallels do you find between uh, Flash Boys and other books you wrote in the past about Wall Street? There's one that's really clear. It's not Wall Street. Uh, it's the closest. So this book, I never, you never want to write the same book twice. Uh, uh, the Big Short interested me because it, it's, it was, it seemed, I thought that was, I thought when I wrote Liar's Poker 25 years ago, it was the only book I was ever going to write about Wall Street because I never have access again because everybody hated me after the book came out. Uh, <laughs> but then they all loved me because the next generation all read it. And so, they, so I had access to write the big short, and I thought that was the bookend. I was describing kind of the beginning of this new structure of, on Wall Street in Liar's Poker without knowing that's what I was describing and how it came to grief, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later. Um, and then I thought I was really done. This was different because this was the first hope, hopeful sign I felt in how Wall Street might be reformed. It was so depressing watching the watching the post-financial crisis action in Washington. It, I found that so depressing. I thought, the system's never going to fix it. Here we have market-based change. This could work. This could work. And, and, but more than that, market-based change that was laced with idealism. People actually wanted their life to have meaning and purpose in the financial sector, which was a novel idea. And, uh, and, and he was attracting people like himself, right? He, he didn't just want to make money. He wanted to make the world better in the financial sector. Uh, that's just great. The thing that was mo the book that's the most similar in my experience was Moneyball. And because it was in both cases, you have a disruptive entrepreneur creating a shitstorm. Uh, because he's exposing the problems of the yeah. industry at the yeah. same time. And, um, and the response to the two books, very similar. Interesting. The outrage on the back end of it, very I also similar. think that I saw somewhere, maybe on a Charlie Rose interview, where you compared it to the Lord of the Ring. Ah, well, he's Frodo. Yeah. Right. So I thought, I, <laughs> right. I, I, I was thinking of the great, the, and this had a, myth, a mythical dimension to it. And I thought, what is this like? And I thought he, that he actually is Frodo in Lord of the Rings. He's, he's sitting in the middle of, of this, what is going to be a war of the worlds. And on one side are the orcs, which are high frequency trading firms <laughs> and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, ex the public exchanges that have sold themselves out yeah. to high frequency traders. And on the other side are, uh, are you know, hobbits and elves and dwarfs, and these are, these are small investors, these are institutional investors. Is he, and he was, there was no, th their interests are, are so opposed on this issue. Yeah. The actual, actual investors who are serving a social function, um, have, are, are, their interests are so opposed to the existing structure. And the, the question was how the collision was going right. to happen. And he was the, he's the mechanism yes. for the collision. So, so 
as long as he survives, we're, the world, this hope. And thrives. <laughs> and thrives. Um, so survive. Let's just start with survive. Right. Um, right. So, uh, Brad, I think that, you know, specifically here in the Valley, you see a lot of, obviously, disruption is, is, is one big buzzword. And it's somewhat different, I think, if you are coming from the outside, take on Elon Musk, right? One of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time, disrupting automotive or, or sort of like uh, sp space exploration. But he's an outsider. Right, so you come in and you disrupt from the outside. You're an insider. You are working for the same, some of the firms, or you dealt with some of the firms that now have a very different uh, interest than yours. What is it like to be an insider who is disrupting? It's definitely a lot more uncomfortable. Um, I, you know, I think the, the, the hard part about, about Flash Boys was that when it went off, um, a lot of time people on their way out say things and, right. and do things. And, um, the next day, I had to show up again and, and face a lot of the people that, that absolutely got destroyed in the book. And uh, so it, it, it was uncomfortable to a point. Um, but I think, in general, I've never really had an attachment to Wall Street in particular. Um, I, <coughs> I, didn't, I didn't follow it when I was a kid. Um, in college, I really had no desire to go there. I just kind of ended up at Royal Bank because, you know, my, my dad thought it might be something interesting. Um, so I never really had this like strong, I, I guess in a way I never felt like it defined me. Mm. Um, in the financial crisis, actually, and I, I believe this was in the book, I, I sat down with my wife uh, in 2009 um, and I said, I think I'm done. I said, I, I think I, I want to change. Um, it was stressful, my blood pressure was through the roof. I just, I just didn't, RBC really, I mean, I think we were 55th on the, on the list of write downs, so we weren't uh, a major cause of it. it just, didn't feel like something I wanted to do with my life. And then I got switched into a job where I started to surround myself with computer programmers and engineers, and, and, and that's what led down this quest. But I, I was literally months away from just quitting, just yeah. walking away, without even a job. We, yeah. we actually were trying to decide what city we wanted to live in, um, and I said, I'll just find a job somewhere else. So I think there's a general detachment from it. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of let me, in, again, before, so when Michael got interested, uh, again, I had to sit down with my wife and I said, you know, as this is kind of heating up, um, and really you're either all in or you're not in. There's no, there's no such thing as kind of like telling Michael some things and not telling him other things. It's, it's either you're all in or not. And I said to my wife, I said, is this, are, are we ready to kind of do this? So you knew the consequences of going with that book? Wait, this, what, sort of like this probably, even to this day, is probably, this, this will be my last job on Wall Street. And whether I'm in this job for 20 years yep. or whether I'm in this job for another year, um, this will be my last job on Wall Street. I'm, I'm almost convinced of that. And you, you kind of have to come to terms with that before you really, in a way, kind of go to war against your own industry. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've, been, I've been fine with that the whole time. And for those of you who, uh, who watched uh, uh, I think it was the CEO of BATS and, and you uh, going at it. Right. I think Michael. I was a you spectator. You were a spectator. So it actually, it yeah. quickly becomes clear every time I write a book, especially when it creates a, a firestorm like this one did or Moneyball, that at the, at the ham and eggs breakfast, I'm the chicken and he's the pig. Yeah. Omitted. And so it feels... It feels a little like you going on to the school schoolyard and you pick a fight with a bully and say, "Go get him, Brad!" <laughs> you know? and and that's that's what happened. And it, and it happened the first day. It happened with uh, so, uh, so so along these lines. Do you feel or are, are you surprised by the outcome, by the consequences? I mean, IEX obviously. We'll talk about IEX in a second. But in terms of the the public attention to the topic, do you feel that? that has been sort of like well served as far as the book go and goes in as far as what you were- Me, yes, yeah. me? Yeah. I'm, I think we're at a really, really important moment in, in the history of the financial sector. I really do think that this is a, this is a way forward, this market-based reform, and if they are stymied by anything other than their own ineptitude, if they were just bad at it, like if the exchange didn't work, that would be one thing. But right now, the SEC is contemplating not letting them become a public exchange yep. because a cabal of high frequency traders and, and public exchanges uh, who hire SEC people when they come out of the SEC to work for them uh, are trying to shut it down and, and, and finding all kinds of really bad arguments to do so. so and so, so, and so, so I'm, 
I, I was going to answer your question. Yep. There is a minor uprising in response to this. You can, if you Google it, you can read all about it. David Swenson, the head of the Yale Endowment, wrote an article in the New York Times saying, look, the market's rigged. These guys can fix it. Uh, it may not be the, uh, the, the ideal solution would be if, if the regulators actually did something. But these guys will fix it. Get out of the way, regulators. Let them fix it. And uh, it's, it's outrageous to me there's not more of a public uprising. I mean, I think this is, you remember, you remember Occupy Wall Street? Yeah. You should multiply that 20 times and they should be marching around the SEC right now. It's that big a deal. Yes. It's that big a deal. Yes. And uh, at, at stake are issue, issues of fairness and justice and decency. I mean, it's, just, it, it's, it's like putting the financial sector back in its box. And this is a mechanism for doing it. So I've been disappointed. I mean, it, it, there was lots of controversy when the book came out, but I, I'm surprised there isn't more public outrage on this subject. So, so uh, maybe Brad, uh, why don't you walk us through what exactly is IX about and how are you going to level the playing field and why is it that the big other, the other exchanges don't like what you propose? Sure. Um, so, so at a very high level, one of the biggest issues in the market today is that uh, stock exchanges like New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ um, sell two things. They sell high-speed data, meaning if you want to learn about the, a price change in a stock before someone else, you have to pay for that ability. Um, and then part two is that they sell what's called co-location uh, or low-latency technology, which means that you can take your servers. So when you turn on CNBC and you see a bunch of people running around on the floor, that no trading happens on that floor. All of the trades are beamed out to a, a data center in New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, what they do is they sell you the ability, or a high-speed trader, the ability to take their servers and put it in that data center right next to the exchange servers so that when information is broadcast, they're, not only are they getting it first, but they can trade thousands of times before the last person in line actually finds out what's happening in the stock market. Um, and it's, it's essentially created a, a form um, of scalping that affects anyone who's not a part of that game. And that, that ends up being pensions and retirements, and it ends up being 401ks and, and a bunch of things. And it's not, um, it's not happening a dollar at a time, but it's happening pennies at a time. And if anyone's actually seen the movie Office Space, it's you know when you round those <laughs> into the bank <laughs> account and it grows. It, it's, uh, so in a way, it's kind of diffuse harm. You're harming everyone little bits, and you, but it's concentrated benefit. You're amassing, a very small number of firms are amassing this huge, huge wealth. And I think one of the problems is that um, when we started IEX, we said, well, how do we take some of these advantages away? We didn't want the regulator, we didn't want to ask the regulators to change the rules. Uh, we didn't want to go down and say this should be legal or illegal, and, and we're free market entrepreneurs. I mean, that, that we believe in, in, in market-based solutions. Um, so what we did is we took an idea from the existing exchanges, and what we did is we coiled 38 miles of cable in a box. Um, and what it did is it's the opposite of bringing someone close. It's actually pushing people far away. And coiling cable in a box created a speed bump that's now measured 350 microseconds, millionths of a second. Um, Explain how that works. Explain how, why, when you coil the cable in a box, that, that, that diffuses the advantage that high frequency. Sure. So, so when, so. Sorry, I, I just. Yeah. Oh. So essentially, when, when the price of a stock goes from 10 to 9, um, and that's broadcast out, there is a race for people that know the stock is trading at 9 to want to go out and sell to a buyer at 10 if the buyer doesn't know that the price has changed. Um, that trade has to happen on an exchange or on a, a, a dark pool. So what happens is you're, you're racing around to and try dark to... dark pool is an exchange, is a it, private It's kind exchange. of a lightly regulated exchange. Yeah. A private exchange. Yeah. So, so not only do you want to sell to a buyer at 10, because that's not the price anymore, yep. you want to do that transaction on an exchange that also doesn't know what the price is. So what, what you have now is you have exchanges actually, and the fight I, I got in on CNBC was, was with a, an exchange CEO, who is taking in the slowest possible data feed into their market and selling high-speed traders the fastest data feed, which means that the, 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 the traders are faster than the exchange itself, which means the exchange is just printing trades at the wrong price. Yep. Um, so what IEX did is, first thing we did is we, we went out and built the fastest possible exchange we could. But we knew that high-speed traders would always be, have, have a leg up. Right. They're always going to be faster. They're, they're always refreshing their technology. So by slowing them down by 350 millionths of a second, the stock goes from 10 to 9, and they place an order on IEX to sell stock at 10. And it has to go around the coils. 
and as it's going around the coils, it gives IEX time to, to realize the price has changed to nine, yep. which means we won't let any trades happen at 10. So in a way, any investor, anyone in this room that has an order on IEX, every time a trade happens on IEX, both the buyer and the seller are properly informed of what the right price is. Millions of trades are happening every single day between someone who knows the price and someone who actually doesn't on exchanges that don't. And now the, what you say, well, why would an exchange do that? Exchanges do that because the people pay hundreds of millions of dollars collectively to put their servers in the building and to buy the fast data. New York Stock Exchange actually makes more money selling the data and technology than they actually do from trading. So exchanges don't make money from trading. They make money by selling stuff to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but no one, wants, so, yeah, no one wants to pay to be on the other end of a 38 mile uh, coiled, coiled box of cable. Um, so, so, that, that's what done. so technology in a sense, I mean it was technology and regulation that created the problem and now you're trying to use technology to, in a sense, solve the problem. Yeah, you know, technology brought a lot of great things to the stock market, and, and so I think, you know, it's, it's cheaper, it's faster, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there, there were natural efficiencies technology was going to bring, yep. uh, but in classic Wall Street fashion, that technology is being massively abused uh, to the benefit of very few people at the expense of everyone who doesn't understand what I just told you. Um, so, so the challenge becomes, and, and you know, it's interesting, when we found out this stuff at RBC, because we first discovered a lot of this stuff when I was working at RBC, um, I went home one night and was very happy. We made this huge discovery and it felt like kind of we, we really figured it out. And then I actually realized that there's no way in the world we were the first people to figure it out. Because everyone who realized what I just told you yeah. went to the other side and was, was the one exactly. doing the scout. Yeah. No one had talked about it. Um, so you realize maybe we're 20th. Or, or 25th. You're the first Canadian. That's yeah. Yeah. So, so, maybe. So maybe. That, that's the secret here. He's Canadian, yeah. and this is what's left of, of yeah. solid Midwestern that's American right. decency is in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah. So so but we were the first people to talk about it, and so and so, so that that 350 millionths of a second has caused a massive controversy, and 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 to give you a con context. It's one one thousandth the speed of you blinking your eye. Yeah. And I, I read in the Wall Street Journal, there was an op-ed written uh, two days ago by a former SEC commissioner, actually. Yes. And he said that IEX slowing the market down by 350 millionths of a second is going to reduce investor confidence in displayed quotes. Is that the uh, Paul Atkins? Yeah, I, I felt like saying, who, first of all, who can actually tell the difference between a quote showing up now or 350 microseconds? But, but what he said was, uh, and I think that it's, it's, it's important to pause and maybe kind of play, I'll play the contrarian for a second. What he said was, you guys are a band-aid. What you need is like a major overhaul uh, yeah, as far as it, legislation. It's, it's, the classic, it's the classic incumbent partnering using regulation to prevent the new entrant from disrupting. It is, it's classic. And, and what they're doing is, um, Reg Regulation NMS went in in 2007. People yeah. have been complaining about it since 2007. We had the flash crash in 2010 where trillions of dollars were wiped out. And, you know, so uh, we, we, we debated it back then. So now all of a sudden, they want to fix all of the market debates. Let's settle all of that before we approve a 67-person company that's trying to help investors. Um, of course they want to do that. They, they, that. That debate could rage on for 25 years. Um, so I think that it's... It's just, it's, it's, they're using the machine yeah. uh, against the new entrant. Which is interesting. I mean, when I think about uh, an equivalent company, I would think what you see against uh, the, some of the, I, I guess, the, uh, the movement against Uber as an, as an example. Right. It's like, you know that you're really disrupting when you create that kind of antagonism in well, the market. What's funny is when, when Flash Boys first came out, the very easy thing to say was, it's fiction. None of this is true. Brad's full of, you know, you know what. Um, it was very easy to say that over and over and over. Fiction this, none of it's true, it's all, all that. Um, I testified in front of the Senate and basically said everything I said to Michael. I said, you know, no one else from, from the cabal was, was yeah. next to me then, right? Um, but now all of a sudden, if it was all a marketing gimmick, if it was all fiction, why is everyone fighting so hard right. to prevent us from competing? Yep. New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, who are two absolute bitter enemies, formed a lobbying group in December. That says a lot. It, it, it's when, 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 those two, when those two competitors join forces, you, you realize that Can you're onto something. Can I ask a something. question? That's right, please. Because where we are, so when I was thinking of him as Frodo, and I was thinking of the forces, <laughs> right? 
that one of the force, I mean, one on the force of good, I thought, Invest, big investors, that, that, you know, big mutual funds kind of thing would obviously rally to this cause. But I also thought Silicon Valley, because one, they'd identify with his place in this particular market, in the market, but also because Silicon Valley has a big interest, even though, even though the, the stock market is 3,000 miles away, it has a big interest in the integrity of that market. And uh, I, the question I want to ask you is, what could Silicon Valley do to, to speed the change? Yeah, so, so I mean, right now we're we're in what's called a public comment process, and and uh, anyone can write the SEC and voice their opinion about what they think is happening. Um, right now, the last four exchanges, all owned by Bats, coincidentally, um, have been approved in the last ten years, and they've had they had a total of three comment letters between four of them. Uh, IEX has now 330 and growing. Um, but that now, even 330, I don't think is enough to, to really kind of take on take on the establishment. I think you know every time we come out here, it feels like our story falls on more receptive ears um, than back home because th there are so there's there's so many entrenched interests that don't want the system to change. Um, they just you know they they, they heavily resist. So, so how is it, how is it actionable as far as the audience here? You have you have some CEOs here, you have CFOs, and then you have all of us, you know, with our portfolio. I mean, how is it actionable? What can I do tomorrow to support you? So, I mean, there's, pub the there's, pub there's public companies that want to list on IEX. And that's very helpful. So we're, we're meeting with a lot of companies. Um, someone started a website called supportiex.com. And when you go to that website, it sends you to the SEC site um, to, to submit comment letters. Um, you know, I think, you know, info at IEX trading are, is, is a place you can come in and, and figure out ways to help. So, you know, there's a lot of different pockets of influence. You know, the CIO from, from Yale, um, I, I did a talk at Yale, and, and he was in the, he, luckily, he was in the crowd. And so, in, in those kinds of voices, and Michael says, that has major influence when, when people that understand the market or that come from positions of influence, um, you know, when, when they speak up, it, it's actually very, very important. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we just, we just need more of that. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit, and I think obviously your story is, 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 is a very courageous one, but Michael... Mine is even more courageous. Well, yeah, I mean, you're taking <laughs> so on big at, banks. Let's get to the real well, stuff. Yeah, yeah, big banks, mortgage industry, sports. I mean, aren't you concerned or ever worried about... I mean, these are big, powerful bodies. Are you, you're not concerned about sort of like making enemies within those industries? Well, I do. I have made enemies, but it doesn't, you know... What can happen? I can get shot or sued. And I've been did, sued. Did anyone ever dissuade <laughs> you from writing? Does anybody ever do what? Dissuade you from writing? You know, it's funny. The only time that I can think of someone who was kind of a powerful, rich person trying to talk me out of writing a book uh, was Moneyball. And it was, it was John Henry who had just bought the Boston Red Sox. And he was, try, he th he was assuming he was going to hire Billy Bean to run it. Right. And that he saw that there were these huge advantages. He got it. He came from Wall Street. He understood how... You could use data to get advantages in marketplace. He saw what they were doing, um, and he was going to do it himself. And he basically, he didn't say he'd pay me, but he basically said, please, let, what, what can we do to, 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 to talk you out of writing this book so that we can go exploit the market with real money? Uh, and nobody, because if you write this book, everybody's going to know. Yeah. So that was the only time anybody's ever done anything like that to me. Um, the, you know, Wall, the Wall Street, uh, the answer is no. I mean, I, get, I, I've got, I have people who are, what they do, what they do, um, the villains in this case, what they do is they have journalists who are friendly to them, kind of pocket journalists who will write kind of slimy articles, and uh, they, might, they threaten lawsuits. Um, but the, that's kind of it. Uh, and, it. And I do think that I'm in a nice place where I feel like the truth will out. I mean, no matter, eventually, people will figure out what's, what's we'll right. It's out. not that they're not mistakes in books. I mean, yeah. there are, there are, you know, there's sure. a mistake in every book I've ever written, but they're, they're, they're relatively trivial. And so the, uh, the, the, what I've faced in the way of opposition doesn't feel very serious. Um, and the, the, you're talking about from his point of view, from Brad's point of view, when he goes in to try to change this market, he just put it very well. The benefits are concentrated in the hands of the few, and those people have enormous interest in preserving the status quo and enormous resources to do, to, to do so. And the, the, the costs are imposed across the society, 
and no one person really has that much incentive. It's a problem of the commons to stand up and, 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 and take a stand against the status quo. But with, a, with me, it's a little different because I'm addressing a mass, a pretty big, a big audience. Uh, and so the handful of people who are pissed about what I've written are drowned out by the, you know, a million Masses people who read, yeah. who, who read the book and appreciate being informed about yeah. what's going on. So I don't, it's, I really am the chicken at the ham, at the ham and eggs breakfast. I don't have, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel that threatened. Yeah. And, and so, so Brad, what did, the, I mean, what did the book do to you personally and how did it help the company? So, I mean, for the it's company... strange to be all of a sudden like a star in a Michael Lewis book. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, I, I, had, I had read everything Michael had ever written before I actually met him. That's um, not true. You'd read Moneyball and you'd read... <laughs> no, it's true. You didn't read the fatherhood book. You hadn't read oh, I hadn't read. There you go. See. Okay. Almost. Everybody. Don't exaggerate. And I didn't. Read, and I didn't. And I didn't read. You wrote a book called Pacific Rift. Yeah, on, yeah, uh, right. Japanese yeah, and, yeah, uh, little, and American little. business culture, yeah, which, which which I read after we had met. You were really because Mike Michael really liked the fact that I that I was Japanese for a bit until you realized I, I wasn't really much of a Japanese person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was looking for an angle into your character. Just like yeah, yeah. One one funny story is that is that uh, I remember when Michael was kind of digging around. Um, I, I told him that my parents were divorced when I, when I was really young. And I remember you, you, you sat on your seat, you started writing, you're like, tell me, tell me more about that. And I said, well, you know, they're still friends. Um, of course. We still golf together sometimes. He's like, oh, he's like, scratches it out. He's like, oh, that, doesn't <laughs> that doesn't help me. That doesn't help me. I, I need trauma. Um, you know. So, uh, which is funny. No, so yeah, my, my biggest concern um, was that, having read a lot of his books, that, that he, he has encountered a lot of characters and I just never felt like I was a character um, and so that kind of made me uncomfortable like I don't I, I didn't I, I wasn't sure and um, you know he did do a ton of research and he flew to Canada I met my friends and family and and I remember he flew back and we sat down and he, and he basically said I figured you out <laughs> did I say that yeah reverse engineered you yeah I figured you out I was like okay, okay here we go I'm like what would you figure out he goes you were never looking for the fight and he said, the fight found you. Mm. Um, Frodo. Yeah, and he, yeah. Goes, and he goes, you just, and he basically said, you, uh, he said, and you decided to fight back. And, and that, that was actually the time where I just became very comfortable with this. Because, because it, it, it becomes hard if I feel like I'm portrayed in a way that, that I am not. Yeah. Um, and now it, it's, it's, it's uh, Well, you've made many friends along the way. You told me about your meeting with a former president. Right. Yeah. So George, George Bush had read Flash Boys. George, uh, 43, um, had read Flash Boys and, and was a fan. And I was actually at a, I got invited to an SAP uh, CEO conference, and uh, he invited Ronan and I out to have lunch with him in uh, in Dallas, which was which was awesome. There, you know, Michael's got such a huge audience that you you know running into pockets of people yeah. that have that have read it. It's been it's been it's been it's been great. Um, but I, I feel like he really captured the characters. He, like he nailed the characters yeah. um, in a way that I think you know we you know we kind of can all kind of behave the, the way that we did before. So, so just for sake, because we want to get into a Q and A um, and then let Michael go to sleep at some point. Um, uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the the Big Short, uh, phenomenal movie, great book, of course. Um, what kind of an impact were you looking to have with the Big Short? You know, I don't really think that way usually about the books. Uh, I, I was just, I, in the, I started, to, I wanted to explain to myself uh, how the crisis happened. In particular, it was a very narrow question that started it. I wanted to explain how these, the big banks that had call on the best and the brightest for three decades and uh, seemed to be like filled with really smart, self-interested people had committed suicide. That, that interested me. It seemed like, like a puzzle, a, a question that needed to be answered. And so what did I want to achieve? When I got in the middle of it, I realized I thought, like with this one, I had a story that was really significant for the culture to absorb. Um, and I suppose in that case, I wanted to explain, the, I wanted to explain what had gone wrong in the financial system, but, um, but achieve the effects. After it comes out, it's not, I, I move on. Yeah, I really yeah. don't think. I'm really not, what I'm not is a natural Although starter. you are passionate about the cause here. Well, yeah, but you know, it's only because it's so irritatingly obvious, which yeah. should happen and it hasn't yeah. happened. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, 
in, it's in, irritating to you. How do you, how do you think it Oh, it was, yeah, <laughs> it's unbelievable to me. I mean, I want to go, I want to go punch people. I can't believe it. <laughs> you thought, but the, the, uh, in the case of uh, what happens, what d has tended to happen is I'm just writing, a, I'm just a, a narrative nonfiction writer. I try to understand the thing as best I can and tell a story that interests me. And then I'm, I'm, when I'm done with it, I'm bored with it. I, I'm, I really am bored. I don't, I don't go reread it or think about it again. And then I, if it, the big short got politicized very quickly. I mean, all these senators calling me up and wanting me to explain what, how, how Wall Street worked. And uh, the, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission kept calling me. And I, every time they call, you ever seen Life of Brian, the Monty Python? Of course. I, I tell them, I say, I'm, I'm not Jesus. You know, I'm, I just happen to live in the manger next door. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, uh, and, the, the, uh, and the, 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 the book has the people in it who can explain to you everything I know plus more, because everything I know, I know from the Do you feel the that books. the movie did a good job of, of staying true to the... To the, and the movie did a spectacular job. I mean, it's so hard. You, gotta, you have to appreciate. When people really love books, they tend to think the movies aren't as good as the books. Yeah. Um, and uh, if they really, so I think sometimes movies are. What, what is it with movies. Brad Pitt and your, your, your books, by the way? Uh, <laughs> it, it was, it, it's a bit of a coincidence. Uh, he didn't own Moneyball. He just wanted to play Billy Bean. And then we hit it off. I really liked him. So I, I did sell him the big short. Okay. I, I trusted him with it. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, um, uh, the, the follow-up after the, it, it's not really not, I, I, don't, I don't really, it's not, I'm not thinking what's going to happen next. Yeah. It goes out in the world and let the world deal with it. Yes. Um, and so the inevitable question I have is uh, Flash Boys movie. <laughs> and who's going to be playing Brad Katsuyama? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually a funny question because um, the big short movie's done so well uh, and that it, it's probably created some momentum for the Flash Boys project. I don't have anything to do with it, you know. So they, those, the Hollywood people will either do it or not. It's a, it's, it's some ways an easier movie to make, in some ways a harder movie to make. But uh, the one of the obstacles is that he's Asian, Canadian Asian. <laughs> but they don't, they're not, they're no, there's no movie star anybody knows who's Asian. Uh, so, and that actually, I can see him thinking about that. I think that's an opportunity. I think the whole point is to take someone no one knows, yeah. and like. And, and make him. Well, I can see Christian Bale doing anything pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 uh, you know I, I I really don't I don't think very much about it. You go, the the movie people, they they really it really is true. They're much happier when the author's dead. Yeah. They don't want. <laughs> they, they don't they don't want you there. They don't and they, they if you're alive you're this inconvenience. They need to be kind of polite to you and pretend to be interested in what you think. Yeah. And I don't and, and, and it's just an awkward false relation. So I don't really have any. They take the book and they do it or they don't do it. Um, I'd say there's a 50-50 shot. This thing gets made and it would be especially if the SEC does not let them go ahead. It would be very useful if it got made. Uh, well, I'm sure no one wants to play the villain in that movie. Uh, it's it so funny that people want to play the villain in real life. I mean, in this case, it really is. The, the, the villainy that took place in the big short, there was in the financial crisis, there was some actual really bad behavior where people were very conscious of essentially the fraudulence they were engaged in. Uh, but a lot of it was stupidity. And it was a lot of, very hard often to figure out the difference between the stupidity and the and the fraud, uh, and that was and I left that to the reader. I mean, I said I, one of the things I was thinking is leave to the reader. You, you describe what happened. Leave the reader to, to decide whether this is fraud or this is just stupidity. In this case, this is not a question of like is it fraud. These are really smart people doing really crooked shit, and they and they should be <laughs> strung up, and uh, and they they know what they're doing, and they think they can get away with it because it's complicated, and there's so much money at stake. They persist. But, but, I mean, they've asked to be portrayed as villains. There really are villains in this yeah. story. Strong words, and it's a, a wonderful way to conclude the conversation, the formal conversation. So we're going to open things up as far as Q&A. My only request is the first few minutes, if uh, you have questions for Michael, let's take questions for Michael first, and then Brad will stay on that. Then the chicken is going to fly the coop. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do we have mics? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, um, it seems like a very cut and dry case of insider trading where the exchanges are the tippers and the people who buy those and trade on them are tippies. Why is it simply not regulated that way? 
It's a really good question. That's, I, I've wondered why, why the, these are questions. Any, anything that requires actual knowledge should be directed to Brad <laughs> and, and ask me the things that require no knowledge at all. <laughs> um, but I wondered that myself. It was one of the first questions I asked, is this just seems like an insider trading case. It, you, in, in, in this case, it's much purer than insider trading is, right? Insider trading cases are usually, I tell you something material about the company. I'm not telling you the price of the shares. The, 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 you're getting, in this case, you get advanced word of the price of the shares. That seems, it does seem like a no-brainer. So I, the, I don't know why. You want to? Sure, yeah, so the, the, a couple of the challenges. So regulation that was created in 2007 had to define what increment of time was immediate. And immediate at that point was defined as anything less than one second. Um, the other challenge is that since when things are happening in microseconds, um, in exchanges, clocks will drift. Um, some exchanges are time stamping to that level of granularity. Uh, a trade that actually occurred as A, B, C, D, if you try to gather that data and see the way it played out, it actually might look like D, B, C, A. Um, so it's very hard to put together a chronology of what's happened given how this is happening in micro time increments. So I think that it, it's become difficult to, uh, to, kind of, to kind of pin down, unfortunately. The real answer is they don't want to. They, 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 they don't, the same people who would prosecute it for insider trading are deciding whether he can be in exchange or not. And you can tell from their behavior here that they certainly don't want to open that can of worms. Hmm. Other questions for Michael? So uh, one comment, one question on the comment side. Um, you might take a look at Glenn, the, uh, the guy from The Walking Dead, the guy that plays Glenn for the role of, of Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's a compliment. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, so on the question, so Michael, I, full disclosure, I work in the, the financial markets. I actually work for a company that's invested in IEX. Um, I'm curious to know, you've sold a bunch of books, sold a couple movies. Given the fact that you've sort of gone through the Wall Street looking glass and taken a bunch of people with you, um, how do you invest with confidence? Um, well, for starters, one of the uh, you know one of the things that worried me right when the when Flash Boys exploded when the book came out was that people would think this means you're supposed to take your money out of the stock market, and that's not that's not the conclusion you should draw from this. It's uh, so, so though yes, it's true the stock market is unnecessarily complicated and probably and prone to things like flash crises they shouldn't be. The the, the basic like. The value of a share turns on the expected corporate earn earnings of the company you're invested in. And that, this has little to do with that. This is so um, the broader question of how I invest my money. I'm really not interested in it. I mean, I wasn't interested in it when I was on Wall Street, and I wasn't. I didn't ever think of myself as particularly good at it. So I do as little as possible. It's it's making some broad allocation decisions about stocks versus other things, and then once it's in stocks, I buy two things. I buy low-cost Vanguard funds, and I buy Berkshire Hathaway shares. And the Berkshire Hathaway shares I buy because he has the one, he's the one person in the market, Buffett is the one person in the market whose capital is priced differently from everybody else's. That he gets, he gets deals that nobody else gets. And when times of real disruption, like, I mean, maybe now, but if it was, the worse it gets, the better it is for Buffett because he's a very cool hand in, a, in difficult environments. So, uh, so those are, that, that's it. I, don't, I, don't, I, I never viewed my money as something I was supposed to turn into a whole lot more money. I just try not to lose it. Yeah. Maybe someone back here. What, why not put a tax on transactions? All right. This is, a, this is something he's sure. answered a lot more than I have, and you should probably sure. just answer it. So yeah, I think you know, the, the challenge is there, there are a lot of productive forms um, of high-speed trading. So if you look at um, ETFs against the underlying stocks, uh, at times if a big buyer in the ETF pushes the price up, you can short the ETF and buy the underlying stocks, let it settle back to fair value and flip that trade out. So you know, there are productive means of high-speed trading, and then there are also unproductive means. And I think you know, transaction tax just ends up becoming this broad swath um, has all these unintended consequences. Yeah, it's, it's a broad swath solution. I mean, IEX really, we're a precision solution to a precision problem, um, which is really why we f feel that you know, we fit within the regulation and we should have a chance to compete. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the market is better served with precision solutions, uh, and especially ones that are made that don't involve the regulators. Because solving things by rule 
always leads to more loopholes, more inefficiencies, and, and you know, more exploitation. So you know, try to, we should really try to do that as little as possible. The mic, where's the mic? Michael, you do so much research into your books, and sometimes it seems like you can make anything interesting. Um, I'm curious to know. My, if, my wife doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> she has the actually opposite. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know if you've ever kind of gotten halfway down the road towards writing a book and then decided, ah, there's no story here, or it, you know, it, it doesn't work the way I want it. Yes. Uh, What's that been like? A specific example is I got a long way. Never, I've never actually put the words on the paper, but I've done an awful lot of reporting, kind of research, and then abandoned projects. Uh, the most dramatic example was I was going to write a sequel to Moneyball. And I, in fact, I sold Moneyball. When I decided I was going to write a book about baseball, I can remember the email I sent my publisher late at night I, when I figured out that Moneyball was a book. I said, there are two books. Of, the bad news is I'm writing a, a book about baseball because I've never written about sports. And the, the worst news is, is it's two books, and you've got to buy two books. And the first book is only, I'm only doing so I can write the second book. The first book is going to be called Moneyball, and the second book is going to be called Underdogs, and it's going to follow the kids that the Oakland A's drafted in 2003, um, who were drafted by you know algorithm basically, as opposed to scout judgment. And a lot of them were shocked that anybody thought they were professional baseball players, um, or at least the caliber that the A's judged them to be. I wanted to see what happened to them, so I spent years, three, four years, out every minor league season on buses in motel rooms, I mean, just, just following these guys' lives. And I've got a massive amount of material and I can never figure out quite what to do with it. And I think what happened was, the conception of that book was, I was gonna do a lot more of what I did in Moneyball in that book. Um, there was gonna be, it was, it was gonna follow the development of the analytics movement in sports alongside these guys' career. And Moneyball was such, it ended up being so noisy that, that it, it, it ate everything that was going to come after it, I, and so I just I ended up I've ended up walking away from it. Um, it's so hard to do. Ignoring sunk cost is like it's one of those things that a wise person you should teach your children how to ignore sunk cost because people don't naturally do it, and people have like all kinds of mistakes in life, you know, not ignoring it. And I try to tell myself sometimes you just got to cut. But it's hard to do when you've done a lot of work. I mean, you know, it seems like you just wasted your life. But that's a, it's happened several occasions. That's the biggest occasion. So, um, Michael, I know you, you have to take off, and I really appreciate them, the time. And we're not regarding this as sunk cost, by the way. I'm, 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 not, I'm not walking away because I, because no, I just absolutely. figured out that yeah. I shouldn't be here. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> 24 hours on the road, that's, uh, that's definitely a good enough uh, excuse for us. We're going to leave him here for me. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff. So right. thank, thank you Thank you very much. much. Thanks so much. Okay. Back here in the back. Straight back. Chuck Jones from Forbes. Brad, what are the arguments that the cabal is using to not have IEX be a public exchange? Sure. Um, so, so the regulate. There's two regulations. One's the Exchange Act of 1934, and the other one's Regulation NMS. And, and NMS is a 500-page document. And in there, um, there's two words: intentional device. And what it says is that an exchange can't use an intentional device to delay access to quotes. Um, and if you read it literally, you would think that a box of cable is a device, and we're intentionally slowing down. Um, people's ability to trade on IX, except for the fact um, that we got the idea from existing exchanges. So existing exchanges, when you pay to be in the New York Stock Exchange data center, what happened was that people that were in the back corner of the data center started to complain that the people that were closer to the matching engine actually had a shorter cable, and their cable was longer. Um, every foot of cable is one billionth of a second, uh, so it gives you a, a, you know, a, a sense of why, what people were fighting over. Um, but it was a legitimate enough argument where the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and BATS, the three major exchanges, all did this, where they measured to the farthest corner of their data center, gave everyone the same length of cable, and the person closest had a coiled cable. Uh, this has been happening for years. So when we decided to, you know, at IEX, and this is the, you know, we read the regulation front to back, and we said, great. 
Exchanges are allowed to coil cable. We're going to coil cable. Um, the other thing that it says is back to this word immediate. You know, the fact that people making um, the statement that 350 microseconds is not immediate, I think kind of has, have, uh, have lost kind of sense, sense of reality in a way, um, because the market isn't acting in this instantaneous uniform motion. When you measure things in microseconds, things are happening randomly all, all over the place. If you know, an exchange that's located in a different geography is sending messages and you're seeing that at a different time than exchanges that are closer to you. Um, so in a way, intentional device is, is one of the crutches but it just doesn't hold up because existing exchanges under the current regulation are allowed to coil cable to equalize latency. They just coil cable to make it fair for people who have paid them hundreds of millions of dollars for that privilege. We coil cable for free for everybody. Um, so actually you would think that our coiling of cable complies with the regulation slightly more than theirs uh, does. And, and, and ultimately, and I, guess, I guess what gives us a lot of confidence is that Regulation NMS makes a very clear statement where they say, when the interests of short-term traders and long-term investors conflict, it's the commission's uh, responsibility to uphold the interests of long-term investors. Um, so we do feel like, in principle, what IEX does doesn't require any rule change, uh, doesn't require any special treatment. Um, we fall squarely within the regulation. And, and the challenge is that they're trying to change the rules on us um, as we're applying meaning that historical precedent doesn't have a lot to do with, with uh, letting an, a new entrant compete on the same terms. And I think that's, that's really what the, the crux of this argument is going to be. And there have been a lot of suggestions through this process, some of them made conveniently by high-speed traders, on how IEX should adjust our model, eliminate the speed bump, stop slowing this down or do that. Um, and unfortunately, these things would all compromise our ability to protect investors. So we're unwilling to do that, um, which actually makes this uh, a very, very tough negotiation on all sides. Because By the way, what's the next milestone for, for IEX? So March 21st is when we expect a decision. And, um, you know, it's in our best interest to get that decision made as soon as possible. And, um, you know, it, they have, you know, our market's grown tremendously. Uh, our first day of trading, we did 568,000 shares. And we, we were pretty excited about that. Yesterday was our, our newest record. We did 466 million shares. We wow, almost traded congrats. $10 billion in Notional. Uh, the market has taken off. Um, but there are limits to how much we can grow sure. if we're not an exchange, yep. and that, that's really we're trying to remove those limits. So, uh, but March 21st, we, we expect there to be a decision, and, and you know that gives you know we have 60 days to try to talk to as many people as possible, try to garner as much support as we can, and um, you know ultimately uh, whatever that decision is, hopefully we've gained uh, a large enough amount of support that it gives you know whether it happens on March 21st or some point after that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be given the right to compete. Where's the mic? Oh, thank you. Hey, Brad, uh, question. Um, here at Silicon Valley, we talk about strategy and competition and risks. What happens if they do approve you and a month later, the existing exchanges just meet the exact same coiling? I assume it's not a very big technical challenge, right? Yeah. It's funny, uh, so, so Ronan, we were talking the other day, and he said it's, we've spent millions and millions of dollars on technology. Our, our system processed 1.8 billion messages yesterday. Um, and all this fighting is over an $8,000 box of, of coiled cable. Um, the reason exchanges won't coil cable is because they make hundreds of millions of dollars selling fast access. No one will pay hundreds of millions of dollars to be on the other end of a 38-mile coiled cable. Um, so really, it's in their economic best interest to not do that. And that's really why I think there's such a huge fight. You know, the fight really, if IX is approved as an exchange, what that means is that exchanges don't have to compete on speed. It actually makes speed less relevant if an exchange is approved that has actually, even by a, a, a 350 microseconds, has slowed itself down. So if speed is less important, that's bad for people who need speed to make money. And that's really bad for people who sell speed for hundreds of millions of dollars, um, which is really why this, this fight has kind of taken the, the shape that it's taken, is because they know, they know what it means if IEX is approved as an exchange, and it, it means a lot of money out of their pockets. Next question. Um, yeah, this is a highly political issue. Obviously, you know, Wall Street is the talk of the presidential elections. 
is this something that's come up in the course of political debate? Are people aware of this and how it could impact Wall Street? And is that a way to get some advocacy? Yeah, it, it, ha it hasn't come up yet. Um, you know, it, in general, we've been pretty conservative through this process. Um, you know, it was a process that, and again, maybe I don't. Mike would probably make fun of me for for saying this, but you know, we tried to play by the rules in a way where. Uh, all of IEX's comments during this process were through comment letters we submitted to the SEC. Uh, our first one was 26 pages because we answered every, addressed every comment, and our second one was 50 pages because we addressed every comment. And then we found out that no one read those, no one read our responses. And meanwhile, we're getting you know, s you know, smeared all over the place in, in you know, kind of in, in in the general public, et cetera. So we're just now starting to talk more openly about what's happening and why it's important. Uh, but it hasn't made its way to the to the presidential um, debates. We've we've been kind of provoked in a couple different ways to give information, but you know I think that those debates are you know I, I'm not sure. But it, so it, so the the short answer is it hasn't. Um, maybe at some point it, it does get there though. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Brad, you know, the, you brought up the issue of Silicon Valley. My guess is that some of the people in the room actually paid for the technology that's used for high-frequency trading and yeah. created that, much of that technology. <laughs> yeah. Where I, do you I, think the role of Silicon Valley and what they do having public good associated rather than now you having to create a problem that was caused by investments that were made here? Yeah, actually, I was sitting next to someone that, that was telling me about all the servers they were selling to Wall Street. You know, part of it is, you know, technology has, has created so many benefits I really, you know, I, I, can't, I can't fault people for wanting to make trades go faster and, and wanting to create efficiencies. <clears throat> it's really when it's misused, and I think it's up to the industry to ensure that it's not misused. I don't think it's, um, you know, it's, it's a vendors or it's the people kind of creating the, the chipsets or, or, or supplying the servers. It's up to the industry to, in a way, police itself. Um, you know, uh, Rami made the... the, the um, the comparison to Uber, and I read an article about Uber in London, and they talked about, okay, well, let Uber in London if you, you can't show a car on an app, and you have to, you know, administer a five-minute waiting period before a car can come, and all the, and what, what ultimately what they're doing is these conditions are making it worse for the passenger, That's right? right? Um, and in a way, the industry loses sight of, of why the stock market exists in the first place. The stock market exists is to help companies raise capital and to help investors allocate that capital. None of what we've talked about today has anything to do with that. Um, and really our focus is about trying to turn this back on um, companies and back towards investors and, and the shareholders. And, and all of the money that's being wasted building this technology, is, is, it's, it's societal waste. The, the diminishing returns of one incremental microsecond of speed or three New York Stock Exchange has now put laser beams on their roof to shoot messages back and forth faster than subterranean cable. All of that money is just, um, it's really not helping anyone other than the people who sell it and the people who buy it at the expense of, of other people. So, so but, but you know. Do you think that other than technology, is there room for legislation uh, changes? As well? I don't think so, because really you can't get in the game of regulating speed. Um, you know, the, in 2007, they thought less than one second was a reasonable time frame, and now we're talking about millions of seconds. I, I have no idea what we'll be talking about, you know, eight years right. from now. Yeah. So I do, I do feel like um, the market needs to solve a lot of these, a lot of these issues. Um, you know, I did when I was at RBC, we went down to the SEC and said, "Hey, here's everything that we've discovered, and here's what we found." Um, it just didn't seem like there was a lot of movement. And so, so that's part of why we decided to start IEX was to say, let's, let's, let's reform this ourselves. Um, but do it in a way that fits within the rules. It was really important for us to be a market-based solution, which is why it's so frustrating um, that people are trying to change the regulation On the fly. Yeah. to stop us from yeah. competing or, or reconsidering the entire, let's, let's reconsider the entire rule set yep. before we let this company Which in. Which would I mean, take it's, years and, and years. It's, it's the polite way to not attack IEX, but to absolutely attack IEX. Yes. And that, that's been the common rhetoric. Um, and it just gets us nowhere. It's another form of a speed bump. Uh, yeah. So, question. Uh, yeah, hi. So first of all, Brad, thank you and thank all your team for creating IEX. That's really inspiring. Uh, I had a question about your management style. Uh, having read the book, and actually I listened to it on Audible like over and over and over again every night. So 
you have very eccentric people that at least initially you hired, right? You have Shual right. and you have Shualism and you yeah. hired puzzle masters, like <laughs> really, you know, unusual people. But you were kind of okay with it. Like if Shual calls you up and said, hey, I'm not showing up today, you're <laughs> totally fine with that. Still happens, actually. So, <laughs> so how do you decide, like, this person is smart enough or yeah. is productive enough that I'm just going to let them loose for a while? And then at what point do you bring them back on right. track? So, so I think, um, so I guess there's two parts. So number one is trust. Um, we have a, an immense amount of trust in each other. So if, if um, Ronan or John says, this is important to me, whether, whether I know what that is or not, um, it immediately becomes important to me because it's important to them. Um, management style has always kind of been an appreciation for, for people. Um, and in, in, in general, and this has kind of been true of almost everyone that I've ever managed, um, is that their greatest strength is also a part of their greatest weakness. Um, people that are extremely passionate um, have a huge amount of energy and have a huge amount of driving force, but that passion can work against them by being reactive and getting emotional about things, et cetera. You know, John, John Schwal is our COO, and he, uh, he, 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 gets, he has an obsessive streak about him, um, but he also knows every single detail of our business and every single detail of regulation. I've never known anyone to sweat the details as much as him, but it, it's, it, it comes with prices. And so when you realize that um, the weaknesses that at times I have to manage are actually a derivative of the reason I hired them in the first place, um, it actually gives them the room and it gives me the headspace to let them be them. Um, and I, and I, it's funny because I didn't really learn that my, my job at, at RBC at first was to run trading and it was, it was, it was human traders. Um, and a lot of them kind of are the same. You know, they're, 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 most of them are, a lot of them are former athletes. They're very type A, they're very aggressive. And, um, but when I moved over to Electronic and started amassing this team, I, I said, well, I'm surrounded by a lot of like different kinds of people. Um, but I found that the skill sets were so unique. Um, each person was bringing such a unique talent to the table. And I found a common theme in trying to find ways to get them to get along with each other. And, and there, there's a lot of people at RBC here or from IEX, I've had this talk with everyone. Your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, and so is the person across from you. Um, and that, I think, gives a sense of appreciation for people in the room and, and lets you work it out in the bad times. And by, by the um, way, another form of asking the same question is, uh, are you guys hiring? <laughs> so yeah, you know, we, we've been kind of adding people. You know, it's funny, so, so, so this, after the 60 Minutes episode aired, before the end of 60 minutes, we literally had 500 resumes sent into our, our careers inbox. Um, and, and so when we have openings, we actually go through, you know, we've, we've divided them up and, and we, we, have, we, have, we have over 1,000 resumes now, um, or thousands. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we've hired a lot of people. Um, I actually look for people now that, that that haven't worked on Wall Street. I, I find that kind of the diversity of opinion is really important in the room. Um, there are certain skill sets you need to hire from Wall Street, and there are certain ones that, that, that you don't. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're always looking for, for, for kind of you know, the right people. Which, again, I mean, I made a reference earlier to Tesla, and I think that that's their philosophy as well, hire outsiders or people who can who bring a very different philosophy. Yeah, you know, the hardest part about what we do is trying to make something extremely complicated simple. Because the simpler I can make it, the better, the more you can understand what it is that we're trying to do and how it benefits, yeah. how it benefits you. And um, a lot of times, outsiders are, are the ones who aren't lost in the, right. you know, in kind the, of in the, in the details. details. Yeah. So we have time for one more question, I believe. Are you guys finding uh, that you're getting any support from the large institutional investors, the big mutual fund companies, or the large pensions uh, to kind of counter the? Yeah, a absolutely. So, so we're actually owned by uh, a lot of large investors. I, so Kat Carl from Capital Group and, and uh, you know Brandis is here too. So uh, Franklin Templeton, um, Mass Mutual. So we, we have huge support from the institutional community. A lot of them have written letters to the SEC. Texas Teachers Retirement just wrote a really important one last week where they essentially said to the SEC, we have data that shows IEX has saved our constituents, who are teachers and public school employees in Texas, millions of dollars. 
Um, you know, those are really, really powerful statements um, that, that hopefully, you know, the SEC considers when, when they decide whether we should be allowed to, to kind of grow the way we think we can grow. Um, so yeah, we've had a lot of support from the institutional community. Norges Bank, who's one of the largest pension funds in the world, wrote a very um, complimentary letter. So we're getting, we're getting that support. You know, it can, it can always be bigger. I'd say that, you know, there's thousands of funds out there. We've probably had 30 or so write letters. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, we have, we have a really good kind of group of partners. And, you know, part of it, you know, part of the hard part is that we're kind of in a, in a battle and people have day jobs. People care about the markets. It's, it's uh, you know, on a day like yesterday when the market's getting devastated, the last thing I want to do is ask someone to write a letter on behalf of IEX when, you know, portfolios are getting destroyed. So I think it's, um, you know, we haven't really asked for a lot of help um, simply because, you know, it, it's, it's, it just really hasn't been our, our, our thing. But I think, um, you know, given that, you know, this is, this is a real battle. We are outmanned and outgunned and we're being outspent in DC. Um, you know, now's the time where we really, we really got to kind of get out there and start asking for help. Like, you know, now's the time we need it. We, we really haven't asked for it, but, you know, now's the time we need it. Well, I think you've made about uh, 300 new fans here, so <laughs> good work. Thank you. Thanks. like to thank you, Brad and Rami, and we've thanked Michael for sharing your views so candidly. This has been a wonderful evening. As a small token of our appreciation, we would like to present you with the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. And you have been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you so much.